I am very delighted to warmly welcome all of you to our 36 ITF High Performance and Development webinar with the topic Integration of Sports Science in Table Tennis Practice. In our opinion, it's from the utmost importance to strengthen and narrow the cooperation between the sports science and the table tennis specific sector. So we decided to invite today our guest to let us have a look into the theory and also the practical part behind it. It's a great pleasure and honor for us to warmly welcome a great expert from the field of exercise physiology and its research fields. It's Samuel Pullinger from the UK. He did his PhD in sports and exercise physiology at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. Uh, he has been an uh, exercise physiologist and research committee member at Liverpool John Moores University from 2010 to 2014. And at the moment, he is doing it at the Aspire Academy in Doha, in Qatar. Furthermore, he's a lecturer in exercise physiology in the past at the Liverpool John Moores University and at the present time at the University of Split. He's a postgraduate student supervisor, a basis SE supervisor and reviewer. And last but not least, you can find him at ResearchGate, the Google Scholar and the LinkedIn. So thank you very much, Samuel, for taking the time. It's nice to meet you. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, present some uh, sports science information to the uh, table tennis community. And hopefully uh, the lecture and the webinar will be something where people can take something away and actually utilize within their, uh, their daily life and their, their daily aspects when they're working uh, in the field. So thank you very much. And welcome to everyone, of course, uh, to this webinar. Thank you, Samuel, and we are sure that it will be. And last but not least, I would like to warmly welcome our well-known ITDF High Performance Elite Coach, Massimo Costantini. So pass over to you, Max. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. Thank you very much, Samuel, for being with us. Well, our uh, rendezvous with knowledge uh, doesn't stop. So we continue our mission to inform you guys, uh, wherever you are, to give you the best, uh, the best uh, information, the best knowledge, and uh, you know, table tennis is uh, obviously considered uh, a sport in all effect. But uh, there's still some uh, part of uh, of, uh, of people thinking, yeah, table tennis is just tick 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 tick. It's not like that. And today we will see that uh, from the, the the sports science point of view. Uh, the integration is absolutely essential. So, uh, welcome again, Samuel. And um, without uh, further ado, I will uh, leave the floor to Samuel for the very interesting presentation. And then we will inter interact later on with some questions. Thank you very much and enjoy the uh, lecture. Thank you. Your presentation was already on the screen. Yeah, can you see it now? Is that fine? Yes, perfect. now it's perfect. Yeah, now, now it's, it's ready. Yeah. Great. Uh, so as uh, Dominic and Massimo obviously mentioned, the, uh, the presentation or the webinar which I will give to you today is regarding integration of sports science in table tennis practice. But before we go into this, uh, let me give a little bit of an outline regarding uh, the lecture. 
So what I want to cover today is information regarding warm-ups, cool-downs and stretching. So why are these important? Uh, what should they actually look like? And how can we use sports science in creating an effective warm-up or cool-down strategy? And then also we will uh, discuss a little bit regarding the structure of a table tennis session, what we actually know and how we can actually use sports science to help structure this. So what I want you to then take home from this is to understand why structured warm-ups and cool-downs are an effective use and are important before and after exercise. To be able to differ differentiate between what a warm-up is, a cool-down is, and what stretching is. To be able to integrate some of the sports science into creating uh, a better practice session. And then also appreciate the needs of different, different athletes according to age, according to ability, but also according to gender. So what do we currently know? Well, we know that warm-up could always take place before exercise. We know that a cool-down could occur after exercise, but we should use stretching during both these um, protocols. So we know that warm-up, stretching, and cooling down all have different functions. But stretching does not consist of a complete warm up or a complete cool down. It is only one aspect of that particular session. But what are the differences? So, if we have a look at a warm up, it actually prepares us or prepares the athlete for competition or for training. While a cool down allows the heart rate and the breathing to return to normal and promotes some form of relaxation after we've done some heavy exertion. And stretching, this increases our range of mo uh, motion and reduces our injury risk and age recovery. But the first part I want to focus on is the warm-up. So what is a warm-up? Well, we know that a warm-up is to prepare ourselves for a physical activity by doing some gentle exercises and stretches. But what actually happens in a warm-up? Well, we know full well. If we think about a warm-up, and what our coaches used to tell us to do, even when I was younger, is run a few laps around the table tennis court, run a few laps around the sports court, increase your heart rate, a little bit of stretching, and you're done. But the reality is it's a little bit more complex than that. So why do we actually warm up? Well, obviously because others do it. Otherwise, why would we do it? Well, not really. So instead of us viewing a warm up as an obstacle or something which takes time, which is difficult to do, we should actually embrace all these benefits and utilize it as an integral component prior to any training or any match. This is a vital component. This is what we should always start with. So why do we warm up? Well, one of the three reasons, it helps prepare our body for subsequent exercise and training. So it increases our body temperature and increases our heart rate. It can prevent from potential injury during exercise, so it means that we have less pains, less aches. And finally, it helps us to prepare mentally, so it helps us to focus. There's also this psychological aspect with warming up. What are some of the established um, findings, though, within the literature? Well, we know that there's reduced muscle stiffness when we warm up, that there's more oxygen to the working muscle because our heart rate increases, there's better blood flow, there's an improved mental focus. There's increased muscle fiber performance, so we're actually a little bit stronger. We have a greater speed of contraction, greater speed of relaxation within our muscles. So the reality is there's an increased overall performance with warming up. But how long should we warm up? Obviously, some people warm up for five minutes, others warm up for 10 minutes, some might warm up for longer. But what we tend to find is that a warm up of about 15 minutes or longer in duration has shown to improve beneficially different effects prior to exercise and prior to performance. So 15 minutes or more is more than enough and recommended when we warm up. What is the focus of the warm up though? This is very important. Well, we want to work all the major muscle groups and the muscle groups that we're going to utilize within the session. We want to start slowly and then increase this intensity, just like we would with a car. 
we're not going to start with our car and straight away go as fast as possible with the car. We're going to accelerate gently and warm up the engine before we actually start a race. So if we have a look at Formula One, they don't directly go into the race. They're actually warming up the car, warming up the tires, and the human body is exactly the same. So now these main principles of the warm up. So what are they? Totality. Specific. Progressive. Time. But what do we actually mean by this? So when we talk about totality, what we're looking at is a total body. So the full body needs to be warmed up. This is very, very important. Specific. So it needs to be specific to the needs of the athlete and the activity. When we're talking about table tennis players, what movements are we using within table tennis within practice? We need to incorporate these within the warm up. Again, it needs to be progressive. So we need to increase the intensity, increase this difficulty, and not only during the warm up, but, but also according to this age, to this uh, gender, and obviously to the level of the athlete. So this is very important as well, and something which we will discuss later on in this presentation. So the time, as we discussed earlier on, 15 minutes in duration or longer. Now to the, to, to the structure of the warm up. So we need an aerobic component, an adaptation component, and a culmination component. I mean, this seems a little bit scientific, but let's break it down and make it more simple. So when we're talking about this aerobic component, what we need to start with is this jogging, this jumping, this running, or any activity that will increase our cardiovascular output. So we'll inc increase the blood flow to the muscles. So we have more oxygen for the working muscles. Then we go into this adaptation component. So this is a movement of joints, preferably when we're doing a warm up through this dynamic stretching, which we'll discuss later on. And then our culmination component, which is an increase of intensity to reach higher heart rates and body temperature, which then reaches an optimal point prior to going into the activity or the exercise. Now, if we have a look at some of the scientific information when we look at warm ups, so we know that sport specific warm ups actually show to be the most appropriate due to the rehearsal of the activity and the event move, uh, the event, event movement. So it needs to be specific to the sport. Again, dynamic warm ups show to increase performance, but importantly, as long as there is no fatigue. So if we're doing warm ups which are too tiring, which are too demanding, this negatively affects the performance, not only from a physical perspective, but also from a uh, psychological, mental perspective when we're going into the exercise that we're then doing. And finally, warm ups go to reduce the likelihood of sports injuries in athletes. So people who warm up tend to get injured less easily and are less likely to actually have any issues when they're, when they're then training or competing. But what does this mean in regards to practical application? So warming up, which incorporates stretching prior training or competition is a common procedure. So this is very important and it has shown to enhance performance and prevent these injuries. But very importantly, knowing which type of warm up and stretches that should be performed is the key to success. So we don't just do any warm up for the sake of it. We need to think a little bit about what warm up we need in regards to the exercise that follows afterwards. So it might be that if we have a match, the warm up needs to be a little bit different than if we have a long training. Yeah, so this is the first part of the uh, presentation. Samuel, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you for the, the, the this first part. Uh, yes, uh, we 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 do have many questions actually, but uh, um, I think uh, Dominic, you want to start with your uh, uh, your questions, and then we go with my question. Yeah, you are very right, Massimo. And um, what I got, or what we got from, or what was your key message? So take your time with the warm up, do it in the right order and properly. And when thinking about the different warm up routines like stretching, mobility, running, APC, additional exercises, and so on, Samuel, um, you emphasized also that the warm up routines 
prevent the potential injuries during the exercise. When digging a bit deeper into this topic, what are the chemical processes that occur within the joints, the ligaments and the muscles to do so? So obviously what we're, what we're trying to do uh, with the warm-up is to prepare our muscles by lengthening, contracting and, and doing different exercises, which obviously utilize all these movements and all these functions to ensure that our body or that our muscle in, in, in reality is ready to perform these, these movements with, within the training routine. Because we know full well that when, when we're playing table tennis, there is actually quite a lot of impact on, on, on this lower body because movements are very fast and, and we cannot always do the correct movement because we're reacting to this stimulus, which is the ball as well. So obviously we need to be able to prepare these joints, these movements through routine movements that we use within the warm up to ensure that we that, that, that we're ready or as ready as possible to then perform these movements within within the training or within the game thank you very much samuel and i would like to pass over for a question of max yeah my my question was related to the to the dynamic stretching but uh, you said that uh, we will uh, go deeper later on during your presentation so i changed my mind and uh, I just want to start giving one advice to uh, players and uh, coaches, you know. Uh, um, there are uh, endless uh, exercises uh, to achieve a good warm-up. But the question is, better to do repeatedly the same group of exercise uh, or to vary time to time? I mean, to enrich uh, uh, with different exercise. Uh, there are many players, they do the same stuff, actually. They do the warm up and you can tell in advance what they do, little run, uh, this extra, this and that and that. But is it better to keep this kind of routine or uh, to enrich, to enlarge, to, to make uh, time to time different? Yeah, so this is, this, I mean, this is a very good question. So, I mean, my recommendation uh, would be obviously when, when you're playing a match or when you're in competition, to have routine is very important because obviously you have a specific routine that you like that works and which prepares you not only physically, but also mentally when you go into this game or into the competition. So my answer to that would be when you're competing, try and keep the same routine. Have a look at what is working for you and utilize this routine. But there is no reason that when, you, when you're training that you cannot incorporate different exercises, different activities into your warm up routine. Because also if you're just do, doing the same routine, you're going into a comfort zone. If you yeah. start incorporating different exercises, which maybe place a little bit more difficulty, something which I'll discuss later on in, in part two of the presentation, uh, you will also get some form of other adaptation, especially with younger athletes when they're going through this growth and maturation uh, status, which will be beneficial for them uh, later on in, 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 in their future careers. Yes, cool. Yes. So uh, the, the regular routine to, to keep the players, uh, um, you know, with their confidence and not to change too much to <laughs> establish them and continue, you know, keeping the, the level of confidence high uh, for them. OK, great. So um, again, um, I leave the, the floor to you to going to the second part. Really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So now on to uh, the second part, which is where we're going to actually look at structuring a warm up. So as we've just discussed, we know that there's this aerobic component, this adaptation component and this culmination component. So if we have a look at the aerobic component, so what are some of the exercises that we can use for this? Because what we're ultimately trying to do is to increase this cardiovascular output. So, of course, we can go into some form of rope skipping, some form of running. And again, cycling, rowing could be something else that we could use. The reason that I've put uh, a cycle ergometer on there is because we need to also take into account that if individuals are coming back from an injury to do running, or to do skipping, rope skipping, places an additional load on the body. 
So when we cycle, this load which is placed especially on this lower body is far reduced. So cycling is a good measure of or, or good means of warming up, excuse me, when we actually are bringing back an individual from injury. Now on to this adaptation component. So again, this is the movement of joints through dynamic stretching. So if we take a distance of 20 meters, we can perform any exercises ranging from high knees, where the importance is the form, not the speed. So to get the knees as high as possible, butt kicks, so staying on the toes, but with quick feet, shuffling, go forwards and backwards. Again, this is an important activity within table tennis. Carioca, as much hip rotation as possible with your knee drive on the back leg. And again, this is a very good exercise for table tennis with this hip rotation aspect. Lunging, both forwards and backwards, because this is what we do when we go for a short ball at the table. Squatting, again, forwards and backwards. Again, a movement which is incorporated in our ready position when we're playing or when we're training or when we're actually playing table tennis. A glute walk, so knees up to the chest while stretching the gluteus, while taking a step after each stretch. Pointers, so with your toes pointing up to the sky, walking forward on your pointed toes, opening and closing the gate, or what we call the gate exercises, and bear hugs, where we're extending our chest and our arms to the side to get as much range of motion in our chest and our back. And then our arms forwards and backwards. Of course, there is many other exercises that you can utilize. But what we need to think when we use this exercise or when we use this uh, process is that we're stretching the whole body. Because again, table tennis is a very, very complex sport where we're using a lot of different muscles. Because obviously we're playing with the upper body when we're striking or hitting the ball. But our lower body, our lower extremity is what is getting us to move from left to right. So again, stretching the whole body is very, very important. And this can be done from the top, from the bottom to top or from the top to bottom. There is no right or wrong answer. It's just regarding to what is your preference. So when we think about this culmination component, we then want to increase our intensity to reach the higher heart rates and body temperature to an optimal point. So how can we do this? If we have an area of 5, 10, 15 meters where we're just increasing the intensity from 40, 60 to 80% of maximal speed, four or five times, just to get our heart rate increasing, our blood flowing prior to going to the table. Or what we can do if we want something a little bit more specific to table tennis, we can do this shadow practice where we're actually shadowing the individual while they're holding the racket. And if he moves to the right, the person on the opposite of the table is following the exact movement. Or he can do the opposite movement when the individual is moving towards the right, the other individual moves towards the left. What's important to incorporate or to understand when we're doing a warm up is this youth physical development model. So now we're specifically going to focus on the one for males. So as we can see, there's different age periods within the process of adulthood and childhood. So we have this early childhood, this middle childhood, this adolescence and this adulthood. So they're all different and are all within age ranges. What we need to understand as well is all of these differ with growth rates, maturational status, training adaptation, physical quality, and also the structure of our training and the structure of our warm-up and what we should focus on. Because we know full well that when we're young, we're small, and as we grow older, we become taller, we become more physically able, so things do actually change and also need to change when we're giving and structuring a proper warm-up. So if we have a look at what this actually looks like when we look at this model, so we can see that everything changes, the focus changes, physical quality for early childhood is more fundamental movement. Well, when we have the fundamental movement qualities, we go into these sport specific qualities. When we're very young, unstructured warm ups, unstructured exercise is fine. 
but when we're getting older, when we have better ability with these different movements, with agility, with speed, with power, with strengths, we need to increase the structure that we provide, not only within the warm-up, but also within the training that we give to the athletes. So now if we have a look at males and females, so I don't want you to focus on anything else but the two arrows which, is, which have just popped up on the screen. So if we have a look, look at this peak height velocity, you can see that in males, it actually occurs when they're 14 years old, so around this age. But in females, it occurs two years earlier. So what does this actually mean? Well, it means that females mature slightly earlier. We know this. So they're actually able, and they should be given, a slightly more structured warm-up when it comes to males because they're able to perform exercises which are of a more difficult uh, physical quality. If you have a look, this, as I mentioned before, fundamental movement needs to be given when they're young and the sport-specific movements and sport-specific training needs to be given when they're older and when they're able, so when they're more mature. So what is the aim of our warm-up? Or the warm-up. It's to deliver additional technical development by reinforcing some of the movements that we use in table tennis. But prior to doing this, we need to also make sure that we have this fundamental movement skill. So our athletes need to be able to walk, to run, to skip, to jump, to throw, to stalk, stand, to strike, to kick, to catch, to balance. So when we're talking about these younger athletes, there is no problem with incorporating games which are in, which include throwing which include striking, which include, include kicking, which include catching, because this is a fundamental movement skill, which later on in their career, later on in their maturation, will help them become a better athlete. But now we want to look at some of the more table tennis specific movements that we should be capable of performing as athletes. So acceleration, deceleration, uh, ready position, directional step, hip turn, lateral shuffle, crossover step, speed and power cut, curve run, S-line run, circle run. These are all important movements that our athletes should be able to do prior to going into this really structured warm-up, really structured sessions. And I highlight acceleration and deceleration, and I will tell you why. Because the ability to change direction very quickly is essential as a physical component within performance in racket sports and also table tennis. Rapid changes in direction occur over a minimal amount of time and distance in response to this external stimuli. In our case, the change of the racket when the, when the individual is playing a different serve, the movement of the ball, whatever it may be. And the characteristics of rapid deceleration have been associated with success. So to be able to decelerate and plant your foot in the correct position and then come back towards a different position at the table will be the difference within a successful shot and an unsuccessful shot because you'll either be able to get to the ball or not be able to get to the ball. That is the reality of this. So if we have a look at these different categories, so we might place a low emphasis on curve runs, S-line runs, circle runs, slightly more important on speed cuts, power cuts. Again, acceleration and deceleration is probably high importance. And then for table tennis, I would say this ready position, this directional step, this hip turn, lateral shuffle, uh, and crossover step is extremely important. So let's have a look at some of these movements uh, in more detail. So here we're looking at an acceleration and a deceleration to ready position.
So again, having a look at the video and the movements which are incorporated, which were kindly provided by one of the strength and conditioning coaches at Aspire Academy, which is now a main focus with these younger athletes, where we're really focusing on these generic movements to make sure that they have the fundamentals in place prior to going on to these sport specific movements that we need within table tennis. So knowing all this, what are the aims and objectives of the warm-up? Well, to develop a technique in a broad range of sports generic movement skills to master this technique, to improve the acceleration, but we want to, this to be done through the correct running mechanics. And we want to enhance the ability of the athlete to decelerate in numerous different positions because we're not always decelerating the same way. So we need to lay a foundation. The foundation is by movement drill characteristics. So the different characteristics of different movements. Plus games for engagement. So can we incorporate this within games? Because this is the best way to engage athletes and to engage individuals without them knowing that they're actually doing or performing these, these drills, these exercises. So athletes who are able to effectively and efficiently perform these movements will be the individuals who maximize performance later on. So if we look at the science, what do we know? Well, the number of deceleration and acceleration movement patterns and the average amount of distance covered during training, training sessions was higher in senior athletes. So if you have a look at this blue circle, you can see that senior athletes on, av on average are covering more distance, but they're also performing more decelerations and more accelerations. And interestingly, what you're actually finding is when these individuals who are senior athletes, they're actually performing more decelerations than accelerations when they're training. While the younger athletes who are still maturing or still going through this learning process are performing more accelerations than decelerations. So they're actually unable to decelerate correctly. That's part two done. Thank you very much, Samuel, for the interesting part two. And uh, I would like to start with a question uh, regarding the quick change of direction. Samuel, yeah. would you recommend exercises which force the, the quick change of direction if the athlete's muscle, especially the, the one of the lower body, I mean, aren't all well developed yet? Good question. So what we can do, obviously, when athletes are not fully developed is we can incorporate an exercise which places a little bit less load on the individual. So instead of having a change of direction from uh, a running position where they, they run and you might point left or right and they have to change direction and go into this way, into this direction, sorry, what you can do, for example, is to have an athlete stand in front of you and have a signal which is left and right, which you then provide to the athlete. So there is a little bit less load placed on, on, on the muscle and obviously a little bit less chance of injury. So we should still incorporate, we should still incorporate this movement for these, uh, for these younger athletes, even if the muscles are not fully developed, because obviously this is part and process of this, of this de development fundamental skills, which they require, which will then ultimately, when they're older, reduce their, their injury risk because they're actually able to correctly uh, change direction. But obviously this is something that needs to be coached and this is something that we need to look at when we when we provide these exercises. Thank you very much. So it's all about the adaptation, right? It's all about the adaptation and obviously understanding our athletes. So if we if we have an athlete which is not able to run correctly and not able to move their feet correctly, then of, of course let's incorporate ladders first, let's incorporate basic movements to make sure that they can run in a correct fashion and that they can move left to right in a correct fashion before we place this load or this 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 change of direction uh, into their training or, or into their uh, warm-up routine. Thank you very much, Mas uh, Massimo, I say sorry. I was a little bit <laughs> in front. Thank you very much, Samuel. And I would like to pass over to you, Massimo, now. 
Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, um, Samuel, you, you, you spoiled all my question because I prepared, but you already answered uh, most of them, so I have to change. I'm impro improvising. Uh, talking about the table tennis movements and the video you, you, you showed, um, acceleration, deceleration, uh, ready position, lateral shuffle, blah, 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 and all the stuff, uh, uh, all related with the table tennis movement. But basically, all related with the with the balance and the lower, let's say, lower side, you know, uh, work. Uh, doing the the the, the shadow shadow uh, training, shadow warm up, let's say, with also uh, with the racket, uh, with the upper side uh, um, upper side body. Uh, is it is uh, is it recommended to to have the proper, uh, you know? Uh, feeling about the movement of the lower side in connection with the with the upper side. Yes, so of course. So obviously to incorporate these sport specific movements where we do incorporate the racket is obviously very important and is something where when these athletes are able to do these movements, we can actually integrate within the warm up because it's more specific. But when they're younger, to first have them to be able to perform the exercises without having to think of the upper extremity as well, obviously, is more important. Once they reach a level where, where they're able to move correctly, then I, I of course, recommend that we, that we incorporate shadow training or the, or, or, or the shadow table uh, warm-up utilising utilizing the racket. But when they're younger, because we're aware that the movements in the lower extremity maybe are not fully established yet to then also incorporate this upper body where they have to think of also doing the correct technique with the racket is obviously not as beneficial as only focusing on the uh, on the lower movement great okay thank you um i think we are ready to move to the to the third part and uh, again back Perfect. to you, thank you very much. So on to the third part. Here we will discuss how we can integrate this warm-up into training. So we've discussed the fundamental skills that our athletes should have. We're aware that according to different ages, different maturation, different physical qualities are required. Training structures could vary a little bit, but what does this look like? in the reality. So let's have a little think of our warm up area prior to training. So this could be a normal setup that we might incorporate uh, in my case for athletes which are around uh, mini cadet to cadet where you can see we integrate this aerobic component with the skipping aspect. So we will we'll do some form of skipping for approximately three to five minutes. And then we go into this adaptation component where there's some jumping, landing, shuffling, different exercises, dynamic exercises that we're utilizing for this adaptation component. And then we finish off with this culmination component. What I like to do is I like to integrate this through a game because what I tend to find is when you're doing games or when you when you when you're playing a game where they're competing against one one another they tend to take this culmination component a little bit more seriously and it means that they come into training in a better mood within a better environment so if we have a look at a couple of games that we can utilize for this culmination component and we'll also discuss why why we're using them so the first one is very basic with a table tennis ball 1v1 where they have to hit the ball onto the ground, it has to hit the ball, uh, the wall between the two cones, but they have to do so while being in a semi-squat position, so they're not allowed to stay, stand straight. Why do we do this? Again, because this is a similar movement, a similar stance to what we would do if we're playing table tennis when we're receiving a serve or hitting hitting a short ball. And the second one might simply be a game where we have a 3v3 with a table tennis uh, with a tennis ball sorry where we where we play key ball and the ball 
must bounce onto the floor while passing to another individual. And again, here, the person with the ball is not allowed to move, but the other individuals must obviously try and defend or try and intercept the ball uh, from the other team. So again, here you can see I myself am the person in the white in between the two uh, blue circles. Again, I'm in a position where I'm changing direction a bit like I would if I'm receiving uh, forehand and I have to go into a backhand where I'm placing my foot onto the floor and changing direction. So if we have a look at how we can incorporate all this within a structured warm-up, we want to incorporate this mobility, this fundamental movement skill, this sport-specific movement skill, this agility, this speed, this power, this strength, and then according to this age, a different structure. What does it look like? Well, we can actually break this down a little bit further. So we can go into some form of general movement. So this is this rope skipping with this dynamic stretching. Then we can go into our activating of the mus muscle. So as you can see, the individuals in the activating part are using a band to have some form of uh, extra difficulty. Again, this is very good for the older individuals and also some of the younger individuals using a band which has a little bit more flexibility. Go into the more dynamic stretching but on the floor, so without movement. Then into our movement specific jumps, landing, but the change of direction into ladders. And then we can go into our readiness and the game. And I'm not saying that we should do this every single warm up, but this is something that we can do two, three times per week. Because when we're doing this, we're incorporating also aspects of agility, aspects of speed, aspects of power and aspects of strength. And if we want to make it a little bit more difficult, we can do it with the bands. If we don't want to make it as difficult, we can do it uh, with low ladders or with low uh, hurdles, excuse me. So it depends on what we want to achieve. We can change and incorporate different things. So once we've incorporated all this, obviously we go into the training aspect. So when we talk about the training aspect, our warm up to prepare us for training has been done. So obviously now we need to warm up at the table. So if we warm up at the table, all the movements that we're using, that we've utilized within our warm up prior to exercise can now be incorporated within the training aspect. Very good, very good, Samuel. Uh, <clears throat> I will uh, I will go uh, with uh, with my question. Um, well, actually, the question is related with the, um, the different abilities that you have uh, you have shown before: agility, speed, power. Uh, the question is that uh, uh, it, it can be any uh, sort of a priority uh, according to the the personal abilities you know some uh, some individual characteristics uh, to maybe to uh, push something more in the warming up i'm talking of course uh, maybe more in the agility rather in the in the power uh, or uh, more in the coordination rather than uh, than speed and uh, etc or uh, would you keep uh, a sort of standard and uh, equal uh, let's say balance uh, in distributing the 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 exercises uh, so obviously what what i would do is like i mentioned uh previously is two three times a week if you are doing uh a slightly more advanced or slightly more specific warm-up like i showed before uh there is no reason that with the individuals which are lacking in in in, in specific measures to place a little bit more focus on this, because obviously, as you know, if we're weak in one area, it is going to affect the other areas as well. So what we want to try and do is we want to try and increase all of these different aspects uh, so that they become competent within flexibility, within agility, within strength, within power. But we also need to understand that if we're only focusing on agility and we're then 
discarding these other aspects that, 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 that we still need to uh, improve or that we still need to focus on. There is a danger that these are then discarded and, 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 and lost a little bit because we've not placed any emphasis on them and we've concentrated too much on only trying to improve one. So there is no reason that we can't incorporate a little bit more for these individuals within the warm up, but I would still have it very structured in the sense that have these different variables, these different activities to ensure that they're improving in all these different measures. Cool, thank you. Uh, Dominic, you have yours, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, Samuel, you showed and emphasized uh, that the warm-up exercises um, should be in many cases uh, almost identical with, with, the, with the table tennis movements. Uh, do you suggest this kind of uh, methodology to be implemented also uh, with the beginners or would you uh, keep the attention, the focus more on the general movement parts? No, so for the younger guys, uh, I, would, I would place more focus on, on these fundamental, on these general movement skills. Because obviously, if they're unable to run, they're unable to decelerate, accelerate. I mean, these are still important aspects within table tennis and in, in important aspects of, of their maturation as an athlete. What, what I've found with a lot of table tennis athletes, working with a few of them over the years and, and, and having had the opportunity to, to, uh, to go on training camps, etc., is that a lot of the table tennis athletes actually lack quite a few fundamental skills because they're focusing very much on table tennis, table tennis, table tennis, table tennis. And the fundamental movement skills are actually lacking a little bit, but the fundamental movement skills are also very important in improving the sport specific ones. So when they're younger, I would focus on the fundamental to ensure that they're able to do the, the basic movements correctly. And over time, as they're able to do that, go into the more sport specific ones. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, please go ahead with the fourth and last part of the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. So now on to uh, the final part or part four of the lecture. So let's focus a little bit more on our training. So we know that training is a physical component which focuses on developing motor abilities of athletes. We know that within training, we're looking at mastering a new movement, a new skill, but we also know that this requires practice. So if we don't practice, we cannot master this movement or this skill. And this is the same with the warm-up. And we also know that this intensive and repetitive training is essential for success. But what are some of the components for training? Well, we have a physical component which is generally focused on developing motor abilities. The tactical component which is focusing on acquiring and developing different ways to be successful during matches. So how can we tactically change according to the environment that we're in or the player that we're facing to be successful? The psychological component, which is really focusing on improving this athlete's personality. So is he able to cope with stress? Is he able to change uh, the way he's playing according to the needs or the, the demands based on the situation that he's in? And one of the ones which I'm going to discuss a little bit more today, this technical component, which focuses on acquiring sports skills through motor learning, because this is a very important component when it comes to table tennis. And we know that the more we train, the more we're successful, right? But is that always correct? So does practice always make perfect? Well, let's have a little think about fine motor skills. So we know that fine technical skills involve precise movements using small muscle groups. So these movements are normally performed with great detail and generally involve high levels of hand-eye coordination. So one of the ones which is important to table tennis is this service or serving. 
So this is something that I want to focus on a little bit and, and provide you some scientific background so you have a little think about what we're doing and why we're doing specific things when it comes to service. So the main question that I always have as a sports science practitioner is when should we practice service? Well, this is not an easy answer, unfortunately, because I will tell you why. Tasks which demand fine motor control are performed better in the morning. So this would mean that we would be better to perform it in the morning. Or would we? Accuracy and consistency of serves in racket sports has shown a higher accuracy around mid-afternoon compared to morning and compared to evening. So this is saying that morning is better for fine motor control, but mid-afternoon is better for accuracy and consistency of service. Interesting. But what do we also know? Well, fatigue induces long-lasting detrimental changes in motor skill learning at all times. So when we're fatigued, there's actually not much point in practicing service. So if we're practicing service after a two hour session and we're asking individuals to perform this fine motor control skill learning, maybe this is not beneficial. But if the main focus of the exercise is the service, maybe at the end of the session when players are mentally, physically fatigued, negatively impairs the execution of the exercise. So this will have a negative effect on our main focus, which is the service practice. But for the coaches and the players out there, we know that coaches players are required to process, to possess, excuse me, the ability to make decisions which are dynamic, which require strategic intervention plans, but also which are supported by intense activity of reflection, decision, and implementation. And classroom-based approaches are beneficial, so no one is saying classroom-based approaches are not good, but we have to be ready to adapt to the needs of the individuals, but we also need to understand the science sometimes behind what we're doing. So we cannot just do something because we've seen someone else do it, we need to do something because we understand that doing this is beneficial for our athlete and because we have some form of backing to show that it's beneficial. So now that we've discussed a little bit about the training session, let's discuss about another important aspect. So we've discussed the warm up and the training. Now let's go into a cool down. So what is a cool down? Well, it's the act or instance of allowing our body to physiologically return to normal after some form of difficult strenuous exercise by engaging or by doing something which is slightly less difficult or slightly less strenuous. What happens in a cool down? A little bit of stretching usually. And what I tend to see is a lot of talking. A lot of talking is occurring in the cool down. But why do we cool down? Again, because others do it, of course, because others do it. But why we cool down is because it's widely assumed to promote physiological and psychological recovery after exercise and allows us to perform better during subsequent training sessions and or competition and potentially lowers the risk of injuries. It helps reduce our heart rate and body temperature. It prevents potential injury after exercise and in the following sessions and it helps us to relax mentally as well. So this is where we can mentally relax and have a think and reflect about our session, which just occurred. So what are some of the benefits which have been established within the literature? It reduces this potential of DOMS. It reduces the chance of dizziness and fainting, especially after hard sessions. Removal of some of these metabolic byproducts. It has increased blood flow to the muscle and skin to aid with recovery decrease in lactic acid, and it has a potential beneficial effect on performance 
uh, in the following days. But the question is, how long should we cool down? A cool down of about 10 or more minutes in duration has shown to elicit some beneficial effects on recovery. And I say some because the different types of recovery have different types of benefit and have different types of uh, um, requirements. So what is the focus of a cool down? Again, to work all the major muscle groups and to start with a jog and then some form of stretching to reduce our heart rate and body temperature. But what do we need to consider with the cool down? Again, we need to consider the load. So what was the physiological and psychological demand of the session? Adaptation. So what is the long-term adaptation, the long-term adjustment of the session that we're looking to obtain? And what is the recovery required in order to get this stimulus? And then recovery. What is the process of recovery that we should provide re related to the intensity of the session that was given? So a bit more scientific information regarding the cool down. So we know that a cool down can improve sports performance later during the same day, but when the time between successive training sessions or competitions is four hours or less. A cool down can theoretically reduce the risk of injury during a subsequent training session because a better recovery may result in less neuromuscular fatigue. Foam rolling and stretching may, and I say may, facilitate recovery from exercise because we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail shortly. So what are some of these different modalities? So static stretching, foam rolling, cold baths, and massages, which are some that come up quite a lot within this elite uh, sports and also within elite and, and, and non-elite table tennis. So what is static stretching? Well, it involves placing uh, the body and limbs in an extreme range of movement position while holding this position for a period by gravity, partner assistant, or against an agonist muscle tension. So what does it help? Well, it helps to enhance flexibility, prevent muscle fatigue, and prevent muscle soreness, and stretches approximately 40, 15, sorry, to 45 seconds in duration will show some benefits, but any longer hold than 45 seconds might actually be detrimental to recovery. Foam rolling, the recovery method based on self myofascial release with several proposed physiological effects similar to those of massages, increased flexibility, improved arterial function, reduced muscle pain sensation. But the effects of foam rolling on performance and recovery are rather minor and actually partly negligible with foam rolling may be better utilized within the warm up rather than recovery. Cold baths, so immersing yourself in a cold water bath less than 15 degrees which is used to manage muscle soreness after ex exercise and increases the speed up to recovery. Tends to reduce swelling and tissue breakdown. It helps with this reduction of onset muscle soreness. Improves motor and cognitive performance. And there is some evidence to suggest that using this reduces muscle soreness 24 to 98, six hours after exercise. But it's not shown to be more effective than utilizing some form of active recovery. And then finally, massages. So the rubbing or kneading of muscles and joints of the body with the hands to relieve tension or pain. So this has shown to improve performance, potentially improve recovery and injury prevention. And re but research shows that little evidence suggests massage should be beneficial to fatigue but does find flexibility and DOMS to be decreased. So what is the reality? Well, there is no real compelling scientific evidence to suggest that using any of these tools or a combination of these modalities that helps subsequent performance. But what it might do is it might help athlete perception of reduced muscle soreness 
when pre and post activity stretches are actually being used. But what is interesting is light training followed by pain free stretching is actually an effective means of achieving an active recovery that is far superior compared to taking a day off training. So when athletes are off training, some light cycling, light running is more beneficial when you combine it with pain free stretching than doing nothing. So the message I want you to take home is this. Of course, performing some form of recovery can be beneficial because the perception of the athlete regarding their pain, regarding their soreness, reduces. And different modalities do have some different potential benefits. But optimal recovery requires one of the favorite activities among many young humans and many humans in general, and that is sleep. Because during sleep, this is a prime opportunity to recover and to ensure that our body recovers to a state which is similar or as similar to one before training. And secondly, to recover from exercise, this is an important and integral part of an athlete's training regimen, but without adequate recovery of carbohydrates, proteins, so nutritions, fluids, electrolytes, beneficial adaptations and performance is actually negatively affected. So sleep and nutrition and hydration are three of the key aspects when it comes to recovery. So it's all well and good only doing stretching, but these three are some of the three most important aspects and hopefully something that we will discuss in the near future in more detail when it comes to recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel, for your very great and comprehensive uh, presentation. But before going over to the question and answer part of the webinar, we would like uh, to ask you um, a few more questions about the part four. Yeah. And you also mentioned a little bit the cooling down, the running in the cooling down. But what, what is your personal opinion about a short cool down round around, let's say, 10 minutes for, for the table tennis players? As we do not really produce that high amount of, of lactate during a training session or a match. So, yes, that's a good question. So, I mean, obviously, table tennis sessions vary a lot when it comes to the structure and, 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 and the different type of exercises. So we can go from a training session which is really focusing on this technical aspect where maybe the physical demands are not so high. But then we can go into a training session which is incorporating this many ball physical aspect, obviously, where the physical demands and, and are, are a lot more higher than when we're focusing on this technical aspect uh, of a training session. But I would always recommend to do uh, a short three to five minute cycle or, or, or slow jog after, uh, after a session, not only because of, of, of the benefits of cooling down our heart rate and, and obviously uh, our body temperature, but also it's a time where we can reflect a little bit on the session that we've had, uh, mentally relax, and then go into the second part of, of, of the cool down strategy, which might be this um, uh, passive stretching or, 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 or massage or whatever it may be that the athlete uh, decides to utilize or the coach prefers. Thank you, Samuel. And a short second question. You mentioned now also the, the static stretching, the passive stretching as a cool down variant. But what about the dynamic stretching uh, as a cool down variant to enhance or keep the maximum uh, maximal uh, range of motion? What do you think about this? Yeah, so what, so, so what we can do and what a lot of the literature has actually shown is, is that performing uh, some form of uh, very basic dynamic and uh, static stretching within the cool down can also be beneficial. So there's no reason why we cannot incorporate this, uh, this, this dynamic stretching, but 
at, at a less high intensity than we would do when we're obviously doing doing a warm up because we need to remember that the the main aim of the of the cool down is to is to cool down it's not to warm up so incorporating uh some form of dynamic stretching maybe where we where we're lying down rather than uh where we're actively standing up can be beneficial and and has shown to be beneficial to uh to recovery the range of motion increase the flexibility increase and even to some form of agility uh over time Thank you very much, Samuel. And I would like to pass over now to Massimo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Samuel, for the presentation. Really interesting, a lot of uh, insight uh, information uh, where our <coughs> audience uh, will definitely get uh, benefit from, uh, from it. Uh, my question is the, um, regarding the warm up. Uh, um, um, Players have different performances. Uh, uh, either they they do the, the the training, the regular session, or the competition. Sometimes you know uh, the the schedule for the competition, the matches uh, uh, can be different. Uh, they have sometimes to warm up and then going for the call area and doing other stuff. Are the the warming up? Uh, 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 or let's say, what are the major differences uh, in warming up when you have to approach the, the regular training, which is more controlled, more, uh, you know, uh, drills, uh, uh, repeat drills and so on, uh, um, comparing the warm up uh, to prepare the competition, which is everything but repeated? Yes, yeah, so obviously, um... For the for, for the warm up that we utilize during the training sessions, this provides us with the opportunity to work on these specific aspects. So these specific aspects of flexibility, agility, speed, power. So obviously, we can incorporate something which is a little bit more structured when it comes to 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 warm up during training sessions because we have more time. Obviously, we we, we have a focus. A focus is to improve these different skills. Uh, and obviously, we can take a little bit more time as well when it when it comes to the duration of it. So there's no reason why the warm up could not be 30 minutes in duration when we're, when we're actually training, because this is part of our training session. Excuse me. Uh, and during the game, obviously, because we know that we need to be ready and we have a little bit less time because it might be that we have to warm up in, in a smaller area. Obviously, we need to focus on getting 15 minutes in and incorporating these different uh, processes. So this aerobic, this culmination, this adaptation and fit it in to ensure that we're able to warm up all the different aspects and all the different muscles that we use within 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 the game. Uh, so my answer to that would be have it longer and very structured and play around a little bit more when it's a warm up for, for, before training. And find the routine that works, which is uh, which is um, easy to use and beneficial for the athlete when it comes to when it comes to matches. Because we don't have hurdles, we don't have ladders uh, usually because we're we're obviously away from 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 where we would normally train. So it has to be a little bit more simple, but at the same time incorporate all the movements which uh, will warm up the different muscle groups that we're going to utilize for the match. Uh, I, I take the opportunity when you were talking about the ladder to regarding the tools. I just want to connect uh, this. Um, uh, nowadays, the tools to to have a, a proper warm up uh, or it, even other exercises uh, uh, are important, are essential. Uh, but uh, without tools, I mean, uh, can uh, can be a, a good warm up also without tools, or do you think that uh, to have uh, you know the the the, the best uh, uh, in warming up uh, is, is it is better to 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 get some tools uh, and uh, and uh, utilize them i mean obviously to have tools is is beneficial because it's easier to have a a slightly more structured uh warm up but there is no reason that we cannot do some form of warm up utilizing for example the tables that we have uh utilizing 
I mean, I've, I've, I've utilized shoes before. So obviously not all athletes always come with, with, their, with their table tennis shoes. Often they're wearing flip-flops or shoes. So those can be used as, as cones if we don't have the equipment. So we can use other things. We have to be a little bit more um, or think outside the box a little bit more, as so to say, and use different things to, to, to replace them uh, if we don't have cones or we don't have ladders or whatever. We can always uh, think of other ways and other things that we can utilize to, uh, to set up a good warm-up. Super cool. Thank you. Um, Dominic, I think uh, uh, if you don't mind, maybe I can uh, I can uh, uh, go with the with the question and answer. We are uh, a little late, uh, but uh, this this is too interesting, I have to say. So, I mean, time flies uh, when uh, things are <laughs> really interesting. So, um, um, Samuel, I have one question from uh, Drago Torkar. Uh, I don't know, it's from Slovenia, I think it's from Slovenia. And the question is the following. In table tennis, uh, what should be the time ratio between the warm-ups off and on the table? So you, you're talking about the about finishing the, the warm-up uh, or the, 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 the structured warm-up, then onto the warm-up at the table? Yes, I guess, uh, yeah, what should be the time ratio between the warm-ups uh, off and on the tables? Yeah, so anything anything uh, between three to five minutes would be would, would, would be sort of the recommended time frame, uh, because this is a duration where obviously the individuals are able uh, to recover th th their glycogen source, so they're able to recover their muscles, if you will, from this high intensity last aspect of the warm-up which they just performed, uh, but also is uh, not enough time to reduce uh, their, their, their body temperature uh, by too much, so you still have the positive effect and the, and, and the positive aspect of the warm-up going, going onto the table. So three to five minutes is, is, is ideal. Okay. I hope uh, Drago um, Samuel answered to you and uh, uh, return the, the mic to uh, Dominic. Thank you very much, Massimo. And uh, firstly, uh, Samuel, I kindly ask you to stop sharing your presentation, please. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And now over to my question of the uh, question and answer section. And also, it will be the last question. Unfortunately, after that, we have to conclude. Um, uh, we took the one of uh, Logan Zimmerman, uh, Samuel. And it's a little bit also related to physical preparation. You know, it's a little bit a mix, I would say. Uh, in, and, uh, in training, uh, doing ladder drills, sprints, other normal cardio workouts seem to be negligibly for helping get to balls faster during the matches. But incorporating jump rope made a huge impact. Is there a reason for this? So incorporating uh, jumping, you mean into the warm-up? Uh, he meant, I think, in the warm-up or in general. That's why I said a little bit of mix-up of the question, you know, like... Yeah, so, so I mean, the, the reason why we incorporate and use different uh, warm-up routines is, is because we know, I mean, everyone knows if you're doing the same thing every single time, especially younger individuals, and older individuals, too, for that matter, will be bored after the third warm-up if you're doing exactly the same. So by incorporating different activities, but which are still working and actually doing a similar thing, it, it is beneficial to, to, to have a better engagement when it comes to the athletes that you're working with. And by incorporating, obviously, for example, a rope, you not only have the physical aspect because it's tiring, but you also have the aspect of the hand-eye coordination because you have to understand that when the rope hits the floor, you need to jump. So again, you're utilizing your brain and your brain is becoming active and you're actually incorporating also the mental aspect uh, and psychological aspect in, into your warm-up routine. Okay, thank you. And 
And uh, Logan would also like to know, Samuel, if there are uh, better exercises for table tennis uh, that may not be so obvious that uh, that can give to to the students, you know. So um, when thinking about the dimension, ladder drills, cardio workouts, uh, you know, jump jump rope, and so on, are there any other you know like better exercises for table tennis you would recommend? Uh, I mean, also. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, when uh, when we're going through this maturation uh, part of of, of of our career, when we're athletes, I mean, there's there's no completely correct or completely incorrect answer to this question. So, I mean, lots of exercises are obviously be are able to be used to to incorporate these these different aspects that we're looking at. So, we, for example, even use uh, hurdles to ensure that they land correctly. So we can use all different exercises. So my recommendation would be uh, to have a look at some of the books which are out there. So there's lots of books which are now available, uh, which, which which provide different exercises and explain what muscles they're utilising and why why they're important for, for for that specific muscle group, and try and incorporate some of them within within our warm up. And within obviously our structured uh, support of the athletes. Okay, thank you very much. And now I see that uh, through the Q and A section, Samuel, there is an additional info regarding the prior question of Drago Dorka. And he yeah. writes, "Hi, Samuel." Uh, he he wrote like this. I meant, how many time should we spend to warm up off the table and on the table? So he meant the general okay. warm up and the specific. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, thanks for the question. For the general warm-up, I would say anything between 15 to 30 minutes uh, is advisable. Again, this depends on, on on the focus of your of your warm-up. Like I said, if we're going for a really structured one, then of course 30 minutes is what we'll need because we're incorporating all these different movements. Maybe a little game at the end. Uh, but if our focus is not so much on 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 these different movement skills, but just getting warm and going onto the table, then Anything around 15 minutes is, is is enough, and then for the table, I would say uh, around 10 minutes is is sufficient uh, prior to the athlete going into into their uh, into their drills. Thank you very much, okay. Samuel. And, no and we are already a few minutes over the time, but it was so interesting. And um, yeah, and dear Samuel, we the entire ITDF HPD team want uh, to thank you a lot for taking the time to be here today and for sharing your knowledge and the expertise regarding the topic integration of the sports science in the table tennis practice. So thank you very much, Samuel, for this. Thank you very much. And uh, also a big thanks uh, to all our attendees uh, for attending, of course, and we hope you enjoyed our 36 ITTF HPD Table Tennis at Your Fingertips webinar, and I'm looking forward to announce the next webinar, which will be held next week on Wednesday, the 3rd February at 2 p.m. Central European time. And we will have two real great panelists. One is Werner Turi uh, from Austria and uh, John Murphy from Australia, who will talk about and discuss the topic rules interpretation for coaches. And furthermore, I would like to make you aware of how happy we are to be soon back in the table tennis hall with the WTT, the World Table Tennis Contender and the Star Contender events at the beginning of March, followed by the Asian and World Olympic qualification also held in Doha and Qatar too. And we are very much delighted to announce that the ITTF High Performance and Development Team We'll be also back on the ground with our uh, training camp uh, led by uh, Massimo Constantini and assisted by, by me from the 3rd to 15 March in Doha. And during our ITTF HPD training camp, there will be educational sessions related to anti-doping, media training. And one of our guests of today, one from Samuel Pullinger, talking about the injury prevention and the sleeping habits which are highly important in the high performance sport. And the whole will be concluded with a round table discussion of the, of the coaches. And that's all from my side for today.
stay safe and healthy. And I ask, I kindly ask my dear colleague Massimo for his closing words. Thank you, thank you, Dominic. Uh, well, uh, with Samuel, uh, as you uh, you uh, said, we have another great opportunity to uh, to meet in person in in Doha, where also we have a sort of a restart with this training camp. Um, during this uh, this uh, hub uh, WTT hub in uh, in uh, in Doha, and um, it was great today. It was really great. I, I think I, I mean coming from the the the, the some feedback uh, um, it was really really interesting, important, uh, so informative. So a big big thanks uh, to to Samuel for uh, the presentation for the how the presentation and the, the explanation uh, were so clear and simple. So thank you very much. And uh, yes, we will uh, meet again next week uh, uh, for, uh, for next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you all. And uh, ciao.